And good morning, all you beautiful people. Oh, that's loud, loud, loud. Volume level down, level down. I think that's a bit better. Uh, right, so <laughs> I am very confused right now because it appears that we have Steve in the house. I don't know how, I don't know why. I don't know what Steve is going to get up to, but <laughs> we shall see. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wedjuk Nongar peoples. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders and peoples from other communities who may be taking part in this live stream today. Uh, uh, David says, morning, all recovering from COVID here. I hope you recover quickly. Mm, that sucks. Ah, uh, going back through the chat. Good morning. <laughs> Starting off by saying good morning to Steve the Squirrel. Hello, Steve. Good morning, Peter, Michael, Keith, Mitchell, uh, Stephen, a different Stephen, <clears throat> John, <clears throat> the Lane Sharky chip is here, some call it fun, and who else? Peter is here, David, Amanda, <sighs> good morning, it is good to see you all. Tazzy Bob is here, Alexi, who have I missed? Don S has dialed in. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the dads, says Don, which reminds me, yes, this is going to be a short stream today. I have a hard deadline. I've really got to finish at 11 a.m. my time and not much more than a minute later, maybe a minute or two later. We shall see how it goes because I am meeting my sister and then we are driving into the city and then meeting my dad and our other sister and my stepmom and my daughter and my son and my nephew and we're going to hang out at the Queen Vic Market and for like a Father's Day lunch sort of thing. The um, Queen Vic Market is a big market right in the just in the CBD just off the CBD in Melbourne. Um, so um, <clears throat> Henrik. Oh, Henrik and Luminator are also here. Uh, so how short is the live, said Henrik? One hour, I think it's going to be. Uh, oh, Chip said to say hi to my fams. Yes, I will. <laughs> James is back. I don't know if I am said hello to James earlier, but welcome back. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Trady. <clears throat> Henrik says, so let's do random talk. Only 56 minutes left. All right. There are a couple of things to cover today, and I used the the thumbnail from the stream a couple of weeks ago when <clears throat> I was you know, from doing the the open KO thing, and hopefully we'll do a little bit of open KO. But the time is short, and there are two other things that I want to cover first. The first one is kind of important, and I'm not really quite sure how to tackle it you will start to understand as I explain it because I have to be careful about the things I say and but and it's all right enough preface I'll just jump into it so many of this is a subject which I try to avoid which is Chinese politics because I know almost nothing about it but it is having a um, a bad <laughs> it's causing bad things to happen to someone that really doesn't deserve it. Uh, many of you will know of Naomi Wu, uh, gen often known as Real Sexy Cyborg, uh, who has a very, very popular YouTube channel. And um, hang on, let me bring this up. So this is this, this, this is her YouTube channel. <clears throat> the as far as I know, she is the biggest YouTuber in China because it's a little bit of a strange situation. She is Chinese, living in China, and her audience is primarily Western. Uh, and YouTube is not really much of a thing in China. Uh, it's blocked. And so in order to use it within China, you have to use a VPN and all of those sorts of things. So. It's the strange situation where within China, she does not have a huge audience. In the Western market, so 1.61 million subscribers she has here, it's huge. And um, 
And so she has uh, the things that she shows in her videos and the things that she talks about are kind of um, inextricably linked to the way the Western audiences view China and therefore to the Chinese Communist Party, she is potentially dangerous because she does not necessarily represent the views that they want. And um, so she got a lot of attention uh, a f quite a few years ago. She's been building up this big audience. Uh, and she is a legit tech uh, maker, DIY, open source <clears throat> uh, achiever, <laughs> overachiever. I don't know how she gets through all the things she does. She does so much stuff, particularly in the 3D printing community, which is where many people would know her from because she achieved what many considered to be impossible, which was convinced by a combination of um, shaming and cajoling and negotiating and threatening uh, two Chinese 3D printer manufacturers to comply with the terms of the GPL because they were using open source stuff uh, in their videos and um, and not sharing the stuff that they were doing. So anyway, if we have a look at videos, what you might notice, if you look back at the history of her videos, she was very prolific. Like if you look at the dates here, so we've got a year ago, year ago, year ago, it gets rounded by YouTube, year ago, year ago, comes up to 11 months, 11 months ago, 10 months ago, eight months ago, eight months, seven months, five, four, four, three. So she's, her cadence of video release has been a few videos per month and stopped three months ago. This is the bit where things get dangerous. <clears throat> ah, Mad Techie, good morning. And the reason that I am bringing all of this up right now is that her, her safety or her protection is visibility and people and her not just disappearing uh, because there are two different things that can happen. She can be deplatformed, which is essentially just being silenced, or she can be disappeared rather more permanently. And the danger is that if people stop paying attention to her, um, there is no longer the uh, <clears throat> there is no longer the potential for backlash if she disappears. And three months ago, she stopped posting. So, um, and there's an article here about it as well, uh, and her sudden silence. And there's um, so what happened was a few years ago, because she represents. Um, ideas and things that the Communist Party doesn't like. Uh, she has received a lot of both direct and indirect pressure. I'm just trying to find something. Oh, and um, yeah, there are so many factors involved in this. And as I said, things that I don't know about or don't understand. And I am just some random Western white guy, so I am not <laughs> qualified to comment on any of this. The reason I'm bringing it up is so that she won't be forgotten. Um, so um, those of yeah, some of you may remember that she was when I was in Shenzhen a few years ago. Um, I did a video including a tour of the uh, Maker Fair in Shenzhen at the time, and she was in the background um, in one of my videos over there. And um, so in June, I think it was June 30, she was, uh, she was taken into custody by the, um, the Chinese police. And uh, there aren't really details about exactly what happened, except that she is still back around and I got her on chat yesterday. Uh, I didn't want to talk about this sort of thing publicly and potentially endanger her more if I said something that uh, could cause backlash. 
so I wanted to make sure that she was okay with me talking about this and um, she said yes basically so um, anything that can be done to keep awareness on her and make it um, so the absence of someone can be overlooked so when someone when this sort of situation happens and someone just stops posting videos and goes silent and then months can go by and you start to think why haven't I heard from that person for a while and by then who knows what's happened to them so anyway uh, yeah so she said to go for it uh, I told her I was going to talk about it on the stream today and uh, she was uh, she was very happy about that and uh, so hopefully her and <clears throat> her partner Katie are safe <clears throat> but what it sounds like is that she needs to she needs to keep her head down and not ray not draw any negative attention to herself or she will be in serious danger but the danger of keeping her head down is that her profile disappears and then her safety disappears as well because once she doesn't have a profile her safety is gone um, oh, okay so I will drop in a couple of links sorry I haven't been reading the chat as I've been just kind of brain dumping about this what I'm going to do is the yeah I've dropped in her YouTube uh, link her YouTube channel is in the chat. Oh, and Mitchell did it as well. And I've also just dropped in the link to this article by Jackie Singh, uh, which goes into a lot more of the background. <clears throat> it explains a lot more of the situation. Um, but the good thing is, oh yeah, so here we, here we go. This is uh, a comment that she made. This was after she was taken into custody. So she was taken into custody, I think June 30 this year. And then she posted this on uh, the service formerly known as Twitter, now known as Shitter, uh, call, uh, saying, OK, for those of you that haven't figured it out, I got my wings clipped and they weren't gentle about it. So there's not much going to be, <clears throat> not going to be much posting on social media anymore and only on very specific subjects. I can leave, but Katie can't. So we're just going to follow the new rules and that's that. Nothing personal if I don't like and reply like I used to. I'll be focusing on the store and the occasional video. Thanks for understanding. It was fun while it lasted. And <clears throat> I don't know if she's posted since then. Um, maybe. Let's find out. But uh, where was it? Unblocked pin. Oh, yeah. So she hasn't posted since July 8th which is very unusual for anyone that was following her previously you know there were many many posts per day so i'll drop this link in as well anyway all of that the whole reason for bringing this up is just to maintain awareness so that she does not fade from sight and then potentially much worse things happen as a result of that uh, but I can report that as of last night, when she was yeah, chatting to me, she was okay. Which is good. Unless, of course, it was a bot <laughs> impersonating her, but it sounded like her anyway. It seemed, yeah. System notification, 45 minutes remaining. 45 minutes remaining. Okay, so that is a um that is that i suppose now don't know if anybody else had anything to say about that uh yeah oh james said amy is awesome i love her tagline if i can do it anyone can do it yeah that's right her attitude is very much that um she is she doesn't hold herself out as an expert, even though she is. She, does, she can do incredible work, but it's all about encouraging other people to do things and showing them that they are also capable of doing cool things. So, don't all 
Yeah, Dion said this all started when she went to visit um, Katie's home. Yeah, uh, so this is also getting into it. So um, there, there are so many factors here which make her problematic to the, um, the Chinese government. Firstly, the fact that she's gay, um, which she kept secret for a long time. And I can say it now because it's become public knowledge, but um, yeah, she was, um, she may still be married. Uh, yeah, so she's married to a Western guy, um, but that, as far as I know, is, yeah, that <laughs> it's kind of like a cover story. Um, so for, yeah. Uh, and um, Katie is um, a Uyghur, and then there is the whole Uyghur uh, issue as well. So lots of complicating factors there. Okay, so the other thing, the other news is, hang on, I'm going to pull up another thing here. This is something that I mentioned on, um, so I haven't actually, I don't think I've talked about this much on, here we go, on stream. I've talked about it on Discord and other places, but um, yeah, I can make this official now because it's got the, um, the Dick Smith personal tick of approval. So these books, Dick Smith's Fun Way into Electronics Volumes 1, 2, and 3, uh, went out of print quite some years ago. And uh, so I've been in the process of setting up this site, Funtronics.club, and the goal here is to bring back... Uh, oh, DIY, I want your good news in a minute. Um, is to bring back the content associated with it. But there is this copyright issue because the copyright on the original books is owned by Instructables. That's right. And whoever owns Instructables, there's some... Uh, who's the company that owns Instructables? I'm not sure. But anyway. Um, so... <laughs> yeah, not many, not many minutes left. So, uh, there is this tightrope to walk. Bringing back the content without being in breach of copyright. Which is a really interesting trick. So, what I've done is I've created this site called funtronics.club, which is essentially an homage to the original, but it's not the original. This is where the fine line has to be balanced. And so what I'm doing is recreating all of the projects and rewriting them all from scratch so that I'm not in breach of copyright. For example, so what I did was I created um, a general structure. So we've got here all of the original projects and then there is the first project. So I've done this essentially as like a little example because I wanted to make sure that Dick was happy with it before I went any further. So Funway 2 Project 1 is the multi-purpose flashing LED. And uh, anyone who is familiar with the green book will know this one very well. It's the first project in the book. And uh, so what I have done is instead of simply taking the, con the existing content of the book I have written everything from scratch. So here is a, um, I need to take some more photos and things and I need to do a minor update to the PCB. Uh, I just need to change footprints on these capacitors and I oh, also need to change footprints on the transistors, I think. No, it depends which ones I get. If I get 548s or two and quadruple twos. So uh, it follows the same basic structure, so assembly, so the sequence of steps of how to uh, assemble the thing. Um, it, it's missing most of the picks at the moment, but the basic steps are all described. I've taken most of the photos, I just need to add them in. 
what if it doesn't work? And then I've got to write some stuff in there. There's an explanation here of how it works. There is the schematic and more explanation and more explanation and more explanation. Then there is a section. <laughs> yep. Uh, and <coughs> yeah, what to do next, which I also have to write. So what I didn't want to do was go to the trouble of all of this and then for Dick himself to feel that this is uh, co-opting or, um, uh, or taking advantage of his legacy and the work that went into the original books. And um, when I was in touch with him a few years ago about doing this, at the time, he was happy for me to do it. But that, um, but this is a different approach. What he was happy for me to do originally was to take the original content and just reproduce it. But what I'm doing now is recreating the content, which is a slightly different thing. And I didn't know if he would be okay with that, uh, but I got in touch with him during the week and he said yes, so that's good. We can go for it. Which means that I can now start, like I can finish, <coughs> I can finish fleshing out this project. I can put all the pics in. I've just got like placeholders and make it all pretty. We can do a proper, um, a proper theme for this site. This is just, <laughs> This is a totally rubbish theme at the moment. It's, um, you can't even read the text on here. And I can start kitting up. So I'm going to be releasing kits to go with these projects. And I'm going to be writing, so you can see here, there, there are basically skeleton pages. Um, somewhere here, I think there was a uh, tools, uh, workspace, hand tools. Oh yeah, there are some explanations there, but I need to add photos, component markings, no, I'm sure there was one, there was a thing about identifying, oh no, there's a technical terms section, uh, yeah, so it's a basic skeleton without a final theme on it and without most of the content, but the good news is I now have the green light to go ahead and fill in the rest of this content which is cool. Oh, Peter, that's a good way of putting it, <coughs> Peter. Uh, so Peter said, it sounds like you're doing the equivalent of a fan site. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it is. Now there's a, um, I did make a, where is it? Copyright. There is a, an explanation here, which is, uh, yeah, the, without reading all the words, the basic thing is copyright, is held by a third party, so I can't reproduce the original books without their permission, without Instructables' permission. Uh, to avoid breaching that copyright, text and artwork from the original books has not been used on this site, other than like photos of the books. Funtronics uses all new text and artwork. And photos of original books and materials is provided for reference only. So yeah, I've, I've got to write three books. <laughs> from scratch again <laughs> and then a fourth because what I really want to do so one of the things that I, I said to Dick that I wanted to do was a volume four so we've got volume one the basic theme like the the flavor of these is volume one is uh, no soldering required and that is putting parts together on a piece of timber or a plastic base plate with screws to join them together. So apart from the fact that parts are small and you don't want people sticking them in their mouths, that sort of thing is suitable for kids. Um, volume two is slightly more advanced projects, but done on circuit boards. And that gives you the opportunity to learn how to solder and make more permanent and smaller and prettier sorts of projects, ones that look a little bit more durable. Volume three introduced integrated circuits and that one has more advanced projects, 
but these were all done in the days before uh, cheap and easy access to microcontrollers. So what I told Dick that I would like to do is write a volume four, which then builds on this, the logical sequence and volume four would introduce microcontrollers. So, uh, yeah. What color should that one be? I think it should be blue. <laughs> so we've got volume one orange, volume two green, volume three yellow, I think volume four, the microcontroller edition can be blue. <clears throat> yeah, uh, what, what is everybody talking about? <clears throat> um, oh, Trady Trev says, that's how I first got to know you, John, was reading your Arduino book. Yeah, cool. Yes, uh, who, um, and, uh, right. <clears throat> Now, I am going to, oh, <laughs> Ray says Instructables is currently owned by Autodesk. Speaking of which, <laughs> let's, um, let's start up Fusion 360. <laughs> All right, now, almost halfway through the stream, almost half an hour in, and uh, let's get to some PCB stuff. I will bring this up on the screen in just a moment. Autodesk Fusion 360 <laughs> is booting. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if I could convince Autodesk to allow me to collaborate on this in some way and actually legitimately use some of the original content. That would be really interesting. What I would really like to do is bring back the books as real hard. Why in the ghetto says I'm working on a project <laughs> that will be next month. That accent is so strong, I can't even understand what it's saying. I'm going to have to read the chat, read the message. All right. Now, what are we doing? Eagle parts. Hang on, I'm going to take this off because if I don't do that, when I navigate through my folder structure, it's going to show a whole lot of client things. And so, where are we? Superhouse projects? Open KO, open KO. Here we go, back to here. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> oh, Alexi said, well, I said in the past, if you want, I'm happy to help with the project. Cool, something flying around past my face. Thanks for that offer. <laughs> that is very generous. Uh, Oh, okay, so what DIY said was, I'm working on a project that will be next month in October 2023 on Kickstarter with the help for a friend of mine and it will be open source after ending it on Kickstarter. That's cool, DIY. Can you tell us what the project is? Give a little sneak preview or is it totally secret until it's actually released and up? From what I've seen... Henrik Ostrov said Mac Pecker with cheese for lunch. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to have lunch in at the Queen Vic Market today. Open managed libraries to update. Yeah, so I've got to do some, um, where is it? One down here. I just made some changes earlier today to the connectors library. Where is it? There it is. Revision 367. It's currently on. What is it going to end up on after this? DIY in the ghetto says secret lol. Secret squirrel? Is that the half hour warning? Yes, it is. The Steam notification. 30 minutes remaining. <laughs> These accents are funny, but it does make it hard to understand sometimes. Uh, so, 370, yeah, revision 371. Uh, library, let's update everything from the library. Cool. Uh, where are we? Let's get rid of that. And I want to do a little bit of routing today. So the reason that I had updated that connector library is that I needed a horizontal version of James this connector. Said, where are the party poppers? <laughs> party poppers. That's a good, yeah, they're, they're in a box up on the mezzanine actually. 
Um, speaking of which, I had a big day yesterday. I got through a whole lot of things. Um, where is this? I'm going to open something else. Camera uploads. So I'm going to show you a couple of little bits of progress. Yesterday, oh, it hasn't synced off my phone. I must have not run Dropbox on my phone recently. Oh well, I can catch up with that in a minute. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Um, what am I even looking at? Okay, going to the board layout. So this connector up here. And that's all anyone can pray from me. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> Quite apart from the accent, I don't even understand what that sentence was meant to mean. Uh, where are... Uh, uh, Alright, I'm going to push this to 3D and I'm going to show you why I need to change this connector. At the moment I've got these pluggable screw terminals coming off on this side. So there is a two pin connector. I'm going to mute that because I can't even think straight. I keep getting these messages. Uh, all right. I have hit mute on my computer. So the, sorry, Mitchell, the, um, the voice <laughs> thing is, oh, I've just unmuted it. Okay. So that it can be muted by you. So hopefully system notifications can still come through. Uh, uh, train of thought totally discombobulated. All right, this is a three-way screw terminal, but it's vertical. And uh, yeah, push to 3D. <clears throat> muted, unmuted, muted, unmuted. <laughs> Steve, stop bouncing around. <laughs> okay. Uh, just mute, unmute via chat, so system notifications work. Yep. <laughs> oh, Michael says there are trains of thought in here. Well, not today. Not today. Um, not brain. All right, so yeah, you can see here that the, uh, the terminal over here, this is the serial connection that goes out to the KO pick and place machine, is um, is a vertical format and I need it to be horizontal. So let's fix that. Where are we? This is one thing I, one little annoyance that I don't like. Oh, which reminds me, during the week, Mitch uh, sent me an email with a, I can't remember if the files were in it or just a screenshot. Basically what he has done is recreated this in um, KiCad. So he has done a KiCad version of this OpenKO project, which is really, really cool. And uh, so I suggested to him that maybe I should jump to KiCad and finish this project in KiCad. But uh, yeah, he said that the footprints in his are unverified. And so uh, I'm not sure. I'm gonna, for now, I'm going to continue doing this in Fusion Electronics and finish this uh, take this project to conclusion in Fusion, but I am very, very tempted to uh, to jump over to KiCad. Uh, and th yeah, the analogy, one thing I like about it is that having the same project done in those two different tools, the way I put it to Mitch is that it's a bit like a Rosetta Stone, which is where you have, so with, with the Rosetta Stone, it was um, it was the same text in multiple languages which then allows you to see, oh, it says this in this language, therefore, this other language that I don't know, that word is probably this word here, and you can, it, it's like a decoder ring. So being able to see the same project in both Fusion and KiCad will allow my brain to see the equivalents and do the transition from one to the other, which is very interesting. So, yeah, cool. Um, Peter says, should do all your Funtronics in KiCad. Yeah, that's what I would like to do. The, um, the boards that I've designed so far were done in Eagle, and it was about five years ago, give or take. Uh, so I would like to redo those boards and do all of the additional boards in KiCad so that it is truly open. 
what am I saying? Okay, so I need to change this connector. Let's do a part swap on that. Come on, why isn't... There we go, replace. Come on. This roll is not working. Superhouse, connectors... <coughs> I'm going to be interested to see what happens when the, the Apple Silicon native version of Fusion 360 comes out, which should be fairly soon, I think. Uh, because a lot of this UI frustration, like not being able to scroll or scroll being in the wrong focus, may go away with that. We shall see. So what do I want? Three, I want a three pin horizontal 3.81 millimeter screw terminal and that one is the one I want to replace. So on the board view, that's now a horizontal terminal. Um, how much should I overlap it? Let's bring them out a bit because I want to I want to have them protrude out through an enclosure. Um, this one, I need to bring this a little bit closer to the edge as well. So we're kind of at the, I'll take it down to about 1.5 millimeters. Um, oh, okay, you can't see what just happened then, but this this is an example of one of the many little annoyances in the user interface in the PCB version like in the, the electronics version in Fusion. So I just edited this using my numeric keypad and then I pressed enter on the keypad but if you press enter on the keypad it does not activate the OK button. Like I'm going to hit it. That's it. That's my enter key on the keypad. Doesn't do anything. If I hit enter on my main keyboard it works. And presumably that's just because of the way the uh, the key mapping is done in Fusion. It knows the difference between the enter key on the alphanumeric on the main keyboard and the enter key on the numeric keypad, and it ignores the one on the keypad, which is where you enter numbers. So I keep doing things where I type in a number and just like hit enter, and nothing happens. And then I go, oh damn, did it again. And then I've got to press enter on the main keyboard. Um, so the story so far with me trying to do stuff in Fusion Electronics is that little story, that tiny little piece of friction and annoyance just multiplied by a thousand. It, little things like that happen over and over and over again. Every, it's like every little thing to do with the user interface has some flaw in it or something that is just just makes it difficult. Um, oh, and this is another classic one. So this is another user interface thing. All right, I want to move a part. Now, if I select the move tool, <clears throat> now imagine I wanted to move this part over here. I don't, but imagine I wanted to move this one. Now, if I select the move tool, oh no, there is a dialogue now covering part of my workspace. And the thing that I want to move may be behind the dialogue. And then you've got to move the dialog out of the way. Like if, if you dismiss the dialog, the tool disappears. Like I no longer have the move tool selected. I can't move anything. So you've got to have that dialog open to be able to move things, but it's covering your workspace. And you can, you've got to like relocate that somewhere else. It's just all these stupid, frustrating little user interface quirks. So I keep finding myself doing things like zooming out and then zoom, zooming out, and then zooming in again in a different part of the board to work around the um, the user interface. It just keeps getting in my way. Um, okay, so back over here, I was just moving this, that's right. I don't know why, but for some reason, my brain tells me that I should have these two, oh, and it's still, see, I'm trying to get out of the way. Uh, I, something tells me that the USB in socket on the left and the serial out on the right should be aligned. Oh, now I need the move tool. This is exactly the problem. I want to move that thing. So now I've got to get that out of the way so I can get to the thing that's behind it. So now my USB socket on the left and the serial output on the right are aligned. Okay, it passes through directly from left to right. I don't know why my brain says that I need to do that. Get out of there. Um, but 
It does. I think it's the logical flow coming in from the left, going through this device and passing out on the right. So it would probably make more sense to have, oh, now I can't move that part. Move tool, bring it up there. It would make more sense to bring this up higher to increase clearance around the USB port, but um, I'm not going to. And now I can't see <coughs> the anchor point on this connector to do the alignment. So I've got to move that out of the way with the move tool still selected so that I can get to that. <sighs> Just get out of there. <clears throat> um, yeah, the other thing is scrolling. <clears throat> the big problem that I keep hitting in the user interface here is focus. Okay, so right now, if I do two finger drag, I can move the canvas here. See where my cursor is? It's over the canvas. But what if I want to scroll <clears throat> over here on the left in this list of parts? See where the cursor is? I'm highlighting this list. Now if I two finger scroll, it's not moving the list, which is where my focus is. It's moving the canvas on the right. And then if I click in there, then it will focus on the left. But I've got to click into it, which then highlights this which then changes, like it does the jump to part thing, which then, uh, yeah, it's just like every little, every little thing about the way it behaves is counterintuitive or frustrating or gets in the way. Ah, right. Stephen, <laughs> I just saw that comment. <laughs> Yeah, Father's Day. Finishing early can cause fathers. <laughs> um, all right. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Now, did I need to do any more on the schematic? I think it's just about at the point where I can start drawing tracks in. One thing I needed to do was something to do the power feedback protection on the USB connection here. So people were talking about doing a, um, where is it? Uh, yeah, I've got all of that. And this, the sheets keep disappearing. Having your sheets visible is one thing that you want. Why isn't it up here on the left, like where Eagle had it, which was sensible, and you could have it in a tab and then just leave it visible so you could jump between sheets. But no, it's down the bottom here, and it keeps disappearing. Uh, so this coming in here, we've got VBus. This is the connections from the USB-C connection. This is the power from the USB-C connection. So this will be five volts from upstream going through a polyfuse. And at the moment, it's going straight onto the five volt rail. Why have I used that instead of a supply symbol. So that is going onto sheet three. <clears throat> uh, this is linked to sheet three, position 1D. So if I go to sheet three, position 1D, it is there. So that is five volts uh, going into the 3.3 volt regulator. I think I'm going to stick a uh, I'll stick a supply symbol on there instead. Let's, um, do I have a five volt supply symbol there? <clears throat> What's with my voice today? It's cracking up. Oh, this is another, okay. This is a classic one. Look at this. I've opened the add dialog and I want to scroll through it. So I'm doing two finger drag <laughs> on my, with my trackpad and it's moving the canvas in the background and not the window that's open. Like this is the open window. Like you can see the, I'm starting to sound like Dave Jones. Dave goes off on these rants about things. <laughs> he just, he gets so frustrated. <laughs> he goes off about it. I really sound like him now. Uh, so, <clears throat> all right. Oh, now it'll work. Now for some reason, 
And now if I move the cursor over this, two finger drag is no longer working in the schematic. And if I bring it here, it is working. But you saw a minute ago, it wasn't working. It, when I, I had to focus on here and it was moving this canvas. That is just the sort of unpredictable edge case, weird UI bullshit that is just so frustrating that it just, there's, there are little sharp edges and friction with everything that I try to do on this. Anyway, what am I doing? Supply symbols. Uh, five volt, yes, I'll stick a five volt supply symbol on here. But I am going to be lazy and I'm going to take it through a diode rather than like a PFET or something. What do I do? Let's get rid of, in fact, let's get rid of all of that. Um, I'm going to do, 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 do bring this along here and let's stick down. Yeah, and now scroll is working immediately as soon as I open this window, but it did not do that previously. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You don't know if it will, you don't know if it won't. <clears throat> <clears throat> you try doing something or using a tool and it works sometimes. Yeah, it's just so buggy, so frustrating. Let's stick a net in there, take this up and uh, stick that onto the five volt. Uh, so now we've got five volts coming from, what do I make this? Well, I know I have SS56s. I have a whole reel of them. So let's make that an SS56. It's a, um, it's a good little general purpose SMA footprint, shock key diode good for reverse polarity protection. We're going to get like a 0.6 volt voltage drop on that. So if we've got five volts coming in on the, uh, on the connection from the USB here, from the upstream USB, when we're powering the board from this USB connection, we're going to end up getting um, probably about 4.4 volts. Just move this along a bit. Um, probably about 4.4 volts on the uh, the five volt rail here, which is okay in most cases because that five volt rail is regulated down to 3.3 in order to run the, um, the microcontroller, the SP32, and to power the logic on the USB hub. Where that falls down is power to downstream devices. So we've got five volts here coming off the five volt rail being supplied. Oh, and that zoom, that jump zoom. Uh, uh, where it just randomly suddenly zooms way, way out or something. Um, so we've got five volts here going through the polyfuse and being supplied to a downstream device. And if we are being powered from the upstream USB connection and then taking the voltage drop through that shock key diode, we're going to be only supplying about 4.4 volts to our downstream devices, which is not ideal. Uh, but for this particular application, I don't really care that much because my plan here, my intention, is that this is going to be powered by, oh, it's going to be powered externally. There's, oh, uh, Henrik says shock key diode is a 0.2 volt drop. Really? Is that all? Okay. Yeah, I, I knew that shock keys had a, uh, a lower drop, but I didn't realize it was that low. Well, that makes me even more comfortable with doing this. Yeah, a normal silicon diode is about 0.6 volts, 0.6 or 0.7. Um, so uh, that means if we want to power downstream devices coming off our built-in USB hub, ideally we want some kind of an external power source, which is going to be the case if, uh, yeah, because the thing is that we can't really pull an amp or something out of the upstream USB anyway. So we want V in coming in from somewhere and that could be through the power in connection it could be through the CAN bus connection in fact I better check that so I've got VRAW here coming in from 
So we've got a fuse, then we've got that. Where is, where, which sheet did I have my uh, CAN interface on? Okay, so from a power source point of view, we've got 12, the 12 volt rail connected to this um, CAN header which means we can supply 12 volts down the CAN header, or we could potentially be receiving 12 volts on the CAN bus. Now let's look at the implications of that. If we have, oh, there's a diode there. Okay, so what we've got is, if 12 volts is coming in from the CAN connector, it will pass through this diode, it's on the input side of it. I've already got an SS56 in there for the exact same purpose. It's my go-to for that. Uh, it'll pass through this and then go to the local device. Uh, if we power, if we have power coming in here, that can be delivered through this fuse to other devices on the CAN bus. I think that's acceptable. The thing is, I've got to, what I've got to do is not overthink all of this. I have to, uh, what's the term? Satisficing. It is when, um, oh, Henry asked, could you add some MOVs for protection? Yeah, that's a good point. I could stick a, um, I should stick a MOV across the, here maybe, um, or across the can. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of tempted to stick it do, 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 across this point. There's a little mob that I've been using recently on CAN projects. Uh, let's see. Come on. I just pressed the... Come on. Why is the command line not working? What's... I'm... That's it. Add. Ah, buggy, buggy, buggy fusion. Uh, and now, okay, so scroll is working now. Uh, I know it's not technically a fuse, but I keep my MOVs in <laughs> that one. It's the one I want. Uh, that is a MOV. <clears throat> Let's stick that. Where, where can I stick this? It's going to be neat. We've got heaps of room, so it doesn't really matter where. I'm just going to stick it down for now and then move some things out of the way. Uh, did I have protection? Oh yeah, I do. I've got a, um, I've got a TVS. So I've got a transient voltage suppressor on the CAN bus as well. That's something that I learned a while ago. You really, really need. Uh, I had a situation on a client project where hot plugging the CAN bus could sometimes blow the CAN transceiver. They would just go pop and then they would talk no more. And uh, yeah, that was in a, an electrically noisy environment, but we discovered that by putting a transient voltage suppressor on the data lines for the CAN bus made that problem totally go away. So now we can hot plug to our heart's content and it survives, which I know is kind of abusing the TVS, but it's designed for it. <clears throat> Um, yeah, then we've got, what was I doing? That's right, I was putting a MOV in place. How can I move this around to make it neat? I think I'm, I'm wondering how to integrate it into this part of the circuit, but I, I think I'm actually not going to. What I'm going to do is just put it nearby. Uh... I, there's just not a whole lot of space in here. I could make some space. <clears throat> Five minutes remaining. Okay. So let's um, let's make a bit of space. We'll just move this in. I am going to make it fit. I am. I'm convinced I can make this fit without making the schematic look too ridiculously ugly. Let's bring this. Um, yeah, bring this out here. That'll do. Bring the MOV in. Can I do it vertically? I could. Uh, yes, I can. 
and stick a ground thing on there. Hmm. What part number? I need to assign a part number for that. There is a particular little, this is a little surface mount mov, which is reasonably low rated. Um, I can't remember how many joules it's rated to, the one that I've got. In fact, I think I might have some of them around here. Mm, is that it? Yes. Funny thing, it's sitting, it's sitting right here on the bench. This is a little strip of those mobs. So the manufacturer part number is kind of ridiculous. Yeah, so this is a 58 volt DC rated mob, which is good for protecting, um, yeah, it's good for protecting CAN buses. It's um, a thousand amp transient uh, surge, but it doesn't have written on there how many joules of energy it will absorb. But anyway, that's the one I'm going to stick down on there. And it, it's a it's a 1210 footprint, so it's for a mov it is quite compact. Uh, where are we? Where'd it go? There it is. It is that little sucker right there. And uh, so what I often do is just stick it directly behind the connector. What's this one? Why is it? Oh, that's the, yeah, that's the, um, the di other diode that we just added. All right, <clears throat> so here we've got uh, ground and 12 volts coming in. On, this is on the CAN bus connection. And then the MOV can sit right behind the connector, just directly connected to those two. Uh, where is where is that diode connecting to? So it's going to 5 volts. It's coming through the fuse. All right, so it needs to be in the vicinity of this. What we can do is take this up here. <clears throat> take this here somewhere. That'll do. I think that'll all fit. We will tell once we go to a 3D view. Um, so, yes, push to PC. B. Uh, oh, also, I need to, yeah, this is the 3D view. I just noticed something else. This pin header here, which is the CAN termination, I need to change that to being a vertical pin header. The footprint is actually exactly the same. It's just that I've used a horizontal, like a right angle part on this, which means that in the 3D view, it looks silly. So let's, um, let's go back to here. Where are we? Can termination. Is that one right there? That's the can termination header. So we'll replace that with a two pin, uh, where is it, with a jumper on it. There we go. This one is a yellow jumper. Uh, and that footprint should have now changed. But in order to see that, we've got to save that. And then we've got to go to here. And then we've got to push it. It's not as smooth as it could be. That's for sure. Ah, okay. It, we we're almost, almost out. So, uh, Henrik said, last question, then at time, should a MOV be needed on the data lines? I don't believe so, because we have the transient voltage suppressor. Oh, yeah. So you can see here now, why is my space mouse not working? The space mouse seems to be, oh, there it is. It started working. It seems to be very intermittent in fusion. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I, I'm moving it now, and it's not moving. All right, I'm gonna unplug the space mouse receiver, plug it back in. And now we'll see if we have Space Mouse. No, we don't. It doesn't work. All right. I have to resort to doing it the clunky way. Come on. Why isn't the Space Mouse working? <sighs> um, that's time. <laughs> um, System all right. Notification. Stream is over. I need to... What this is showing me... I really do like using this 3D view in here. This is very, very helpful. Because what I can see here is that I need to bring these USB sockets forward a little bit to have them protrude out of the PCB so that they are accessible outside of the enclosure. You can see I've got overlap on these connectors. And if I can bring this around a bit, there's overlap on the USB-C connector. It sticks out a little bit. I think what I want to do... Oh, oh 
I'm not clicking anymore. I'm just moving the mouse. It's no, it's, stop it, Fusion. Come on. Hit escape. I can't, I can't let go of the PCB. I'm moving the mouse without clicking and now it's just spinning. What, it, what the hell is going on? Okay, go to home. No. I'm just gonna get out of that tab. Uh, and go to here and I'm gonna move that. I'm gonna move all of these inboard by a millimeter. And now I can't scroll. Oh, now I can. Now scroll starts working. Okay. And then get that out of the way. Move that in by one millimeter. And I'm going to move these USB connectors out by a millimeter. Maybe two. No, I think that'll be enough. All right. Final check. I am going to save because you have to save before you can update the 3d view and then push to 3d and we shall see if the connector alignment is better <clears throat> all right yeah somehow my cursor is still attached to the board even though i'm not clicking anything and I can't actually let it go. Like if I click, it's just, yeah. It's a bug in the, um, it's all these user interface bugs. That's, this is what's driving me nuts about the PCB portion of Fusion Electronics. The schematic isn't too, yeah, the schematic portion of it is quite usable. The PCB portion is driving me crazy. Now you can see on the right, the pluggable terminal is coming out to about the same distance as the USB sockets and there is enough overlap there that they'll come out through an enclosure which is good and on the left uh, the USB is slightly recessed but that's just the way those things are and the pluggable terminals are sticking out slightly. So I think that is okay as far as the dimensions of the board, the connectors and the major blocks are kind of in place. On the, the bottom, we've got the power supply portion. Center right is the USB hub portion. Microcontroller is at the top. So it's basically just joining up some air wires now. It's actually now to the quick and easy part of the job. It's been all of this time messing around. Yes, I've got to go. Um, uh, but there's heaps of room. This is not a hard routing job. What do we have in terms of air wires? How many is left? 70 air wires. So I've just got to uh, do some clicking and dragging now and this will get done in no time. It's, that's really close. All right, I'm gonna do a final save. Save that and then I'm gonna, I've gotta save the 3D view. Maybe I shouldn't save the 3D view. It'll get updated next time anyway. Um, and exit out of Fusion. Quit Fusion. Got to wait for it to do its cloud sync. <clears throat> do, do, do. Waiting, waiting, waiting. <clears throat> because I can't just save and quit. It's got to go through this whole rigmarole. <clears throat> All right. Now. Yes. As Imi says, enjoy Father's Day for all those peeps. Happy Father's Day for all the Antipodeans, says John. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> What's going on with Fusion now? Oh, that's it. Okay. Peter is hungry. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go. It's 11.05. I've got to get going to my sister's place and um, head into the Quinvic market. If anybody's in the Quinvic market today... <laughs> Let me know. You should come and say hi. And um, I hope you have a fantastic week. And I will see you next week is barbecue week. So I will see some of you in person and I will see more of you virtually. <sighs> Thank you. Bye bye.